Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Hey, I want to welcome you this year here today. My name is Brett. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And I get the privilege this morning of doing something a little bit different. I get to be the announcement guy this morning. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Which also means I'm the hype guy. So hopefully you guys are hyped, excited, ready to go. It's a beautiful Sunday in Minnesota. If you're joining us in the room or you're joining us online, I do want to welcome you here this morning. If you're you're here for the very first time, I would love to meet you. I'll be hanging out. It's a little bit of a different Sunday for me, so I'd love to hear your story, know what brought you here, hear your story of how you came to new life. Why does God have you here? If we haven't met before, I would love to meet you today. A couple things I want to share with you this morning. Got a few things going on. If you're not signed up for our email, I'd highly encourage it. People ask regularly, how do I know what's going on? How do I get information? Well, we send out a weekly email every Friday. Encourage you to be a part of that email. It'll tell you everything that's happening. And at the beginning of every message, if you want to know, or beginning of every service, if you want to know what's going on, we do announcements right up the, at the front. And so get here early, which I hear people are having to do more and more so you can make sure you get the same seat every Sunday. How many people want the same seat every Sunday? Many of you. So make sure you get here early so you can get that seat that you have somehow put your name on for some odd reason. A couple of things, like I said, I want to share with you. First, there are babies everywhere. If you guys have not noticed, there are all sorts of babies around New Life right now. So we have baby dedications, child dedications coming up in two weeks, in the last weekend of the month. So if you're interested in doing that, let us know. I do have an announcement this morning. My wife and I are not pregnant. Woo! <laughs> but Luke and Lucky Bostrom, Luke is a pastor here on staff, they were, and they just had their baby this week. So congratulations <laughs> to Luke and Lucky. Luke will be out for the next couple of weeks. When you see him, when they're back, congratulate them. That a little baby girl, she's doing well. Mom's doing well. Everybody is doing great. And so if you want to do a baby dedication, child dedication coming up at the end of the month, let us know. And we're looking at doing another one in November and probably another one after that because Luke's life group alone has five kids coming in the next five months. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. A lot of exciting things. I also want to draw your attention to an event that we have in a couple weeks. We are doing 12 hours of prayer and a night of worship here on campus within this space. Thursday, not this upcoming Thursday, but Thursday the 26th, they're going to be doing 12 hours of prayer and then a night of worship. And so we're encouraging people to be a part of the whole day. If there's a moment within the day where you can come in and you can spend time in this space praying, I'd highly encourage you to do so. And then at 7 o'clock that night, we are having a community-wide worship event. So everybody who's a part of New Life Community in some way, shape, or form, whether you gather here with us on Sundays, or you're part of the academy, or you're part of our homeschool co-op, or you come to Awana, whatever it may be, get the word out. We want to pack this place out at 7 o'clock on the 26th for a culmination of a day of prayer, night of worship, where we're going to have a number of individuals within our community that will be leading worship for an hour from 7 to 8 that night. And we're having a day of prayer because there's a lot of things in our world today to be praying about. In fact, if you are living on a rock, maybe you haven't noticed, but if you have been watching the news, there's a number of things that are happening today. And so we need to be in prayer for our country. We need to be in prayer for the world. We need to be in prayer for those who do not know who Jesus is as their personal Lord and Savior. And so we're going to spend that day in prayer culminating with an event that night. And so people have been asking me, are there going to be specific things to pray for? Yes, we're going to have specific things to pray for. We're working with our REACH partners who will be giving prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, we'd love for you to send it. We will not be publishing those things. But there will be groups of individuals that will be here throughout the day praying for very specific needs. So if you have a specific need, go on our website and let us know what we can be praying for you about. Because the world so desperately needs it. Today, you're going to hear a message from Rex, who's going to continue our series in Ephesians called This Is Living, and he's going to share a pretty great story, and the passage was leading us in a direction where he was the right guy to speak. People have asked, when are you going to talk about, are you going to be talking more extensively about what's happening in our world today, and the answer is yes. In fact, our series is leading us that direction next week, and so I would highly encourage you to be here next week as we talk about more extensively what's going on. 
But before then, be in Ephesians. Be reading Ephesians, and specifically Ephesians chapter 6, the last part of it. You want to know how to interact and engage with the world today? Ephesians 6 is a perfect passage. As we go there, as we get through this series, as we continue to move forward, as we look at the world around us, we do need to be in prayer because we know the answer, and the answer is Jesus. And so today, our worship set to begin this morning is going to be about the answer, about our God who saves, our God who is the answer, our God who has a great name. And so as we begin this morning, I'm going to encourage each of you to stand with me, and we're going to start with prayer. And then we're going to sing to the God who can save and change the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. There is a lot happening in our culture. There are many things going on. We praise you for the babies that are being born and the exciting things that are happening. But Lord, our heart breaks and hurts also for all of the devastation and war and pain and earthquakes and hardship that is going on. But we know today, Lord, that you are the answer, that you are the one who saves, that you are the God that we come to. And so we pray to you, we come before you, we worship you. And Lord, we encourage you to be here in this space today, impacting each and every one of us where we're at with your message this morning. As we engage a world that so desperately needs you, we thank you, Lord. We give it all to you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Good morning. Let's sing together. Morning. 
Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for these truths that we have just sung. That you alone can rescue. That you are a God who saves. Lord, that you came, you said, you came to save and to seek, to seek and to save the lost. Lord, we live in a lost world. There's a lot of things going on in the world today. And thank you that we can continually look to you as our Savior and as our Redeemer. Thank you, Lord, for the time and the privilege we have this morning to gather in your name in this church, be it in person or online. And Lord, we commit our time to you. We lift up needs to you, Lord, to those who are in need, to those who are hurting, to those who are going through broken relationships, to the, for those who are going through the loss of a loved one. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters to you for your peace and comfort, for your provision. We pray that you would bring joy that comes only from you. Lord, for those who are in a good place, for those who are, rejoice, who, who are rejoicing right now, we thank you that our joy indeed comes from the Lord. And as your word says, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, so now we commit our time to you and we pray that you would bless our time together as we dig into your word, into your truth. Would your word, your truth change us? Change us. Help us to be more like you. So that as Pastor Brett likes to pray, that when the world sees us, they will see you through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point, the kids are dismissed. Those from ages 3 to 5th grade. Have a wonderful time. Well, good morning once again. My name is Rex Bernardo. I am a life group leader here at New Life Church, and it is my honor and privilege to bring to you God's Word. We're continuing in the series called This is Living. We're now in the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians came even more alive to me when earlier this year, my wife Chana and I had the privilege to actually visit the ruins of Ephesus, as shown in this photo. And these are the ruins of Ephesus now in present-day Turkey. We're, we were on a cruise, and as you would see in the background here, there's a big amphitheater. And tradition is that the apostle Paul was preaching in this amphitheater in Ephesus. And for us, it was a wonderful experience to see this place that the Bible talks about. And indeed, that even though the Bible was written 2,000 or so years ago, that it is, it is alive to us and God, that God's truth lives forever. And it is for us to apply, learn God's truth and apply God's truth in our lives. Thank you, Tim. And our passage for today, then, is in Ephesians chapter 6 which talks about children and slaves and their master, and it talks about parents. So, so I was thinking of this passage, if you are a child or somebody's child, this applies to you. If you are a parent or have a parent, this applies to you. If you're working as un, uh, under someone or if you're supervising someone in your work, this applies to you, and therefore, in, in essence, this applies to just about everybody here. I go, oh, this, is, this is nice because then it's immediately applicable to us. And I was thinking of the time and effort it takes for us as parents to care for and raise our children. And that's a lot of time, isn't it? When we raise our kids here in the U.S., the norm is from, from birth to up to their 18 years old or 17 or whenever they get done with high school and they go to college or they're working on their own, well, we as parents are responsible for teaching them, training them for their well-being. My wife and I have been blessed with six children. They're now all adults, three boys, three girls. And there was a time when my wife and I were raising four children ages five and under. And those were busy, very busy times. On top of that, this is not for everybody, but we decided to homeschool our children. And so my wife was very busy as the head teacher of our homeschool. I was the principal of our homeschool. <laughs> I approved the budget. And all the problems came to my attention, right? Because I was the principal. 
And I tried to do an accounting of how many diapers might we have changed with six kids. And I figured, when does potty training start? Let's just say it's three or th four years. And how many diapers do you, do you change? Number of, uh, uh, number of per day, how many, how many days in a year and six kids? And I came up with a figure of 30,600 diapers. <laughs> that between my wife and me, we probably have changed about 30,600 diapers. And that's just changing diapers, right? So the point is that we, in our society, as parents, spend a lot of time and effort in raising our children. And we're not unique to this. This is prevalent in our society that we spend a lot of time with children's activities, don't we? And I see moms and dads smiling, maybe moms more so than dads as I'm looking at the room right now. And Focus on the Family did a study on this, and they interviewed uh, Christian households, they interviewed moms and dads, they asked them to write j uh, journals of what they did, and they analyzed the journal, what they wrote in journals and the interviews, and this was the, what Focus on the Family said. In our in-depth observational analysis of U.S. Christian households, a primary challenge for some families was the fast pace of life. For these families, the problem was self-induced through the overscheduling of their children's activities. One mother commented that the biggest challenge to her marriage was how the kids and their activities have somehow made it to the top of our priority list. Life seems out of control for these parents as, a fam as family life revolves around coordinating the kids' activities. Family dinners, time with a spouse, and household chores took a backseat to the kids' gymnastics, soccer, baseball, dance, and other experiences orchestrated out of a sense of parental responsibility. These were child-centric homes where one of both parents acted as if they, their role was to facilitate rather than regulate the kids' activities. The parents were unhappy with their out-of-control schedules, but also felt that eliminating activities would be unfair and hurt the kids goes on, most of the mothers in our study specifically and repeatedly stated that they were too busy and wanted less to do. Yet in most cases, they had a significant amount of control over how busy they were because they were the de facto gatekeepers of the family activities, whether they, played, they actively played that role or not. As we evaluated the latent content of our journals and interviews, as well as general cultural trends, we identified three incentives for busyness in moms. Cultural expectation, personal satisfaction, and avoiding risk. In the end, moms have more control over their level of busyness than they may realize, but there are definite trade-offs that come along with intentionally decreasing their activity level. This was maybe a decade ago, and that's the reality. That when we look at our calendars, we are busy with activities that revolve around children's activity, uh, around our kids. And talking about the amount of time we spend with our kids, there's also a very significant amount of time that you and I spend in the workplace. For example, if you work a 40-day hour week, eight hours a day, five days a week. And if you assume that, well, you sleep eight hours a day, meaning you have 16 waking hours a day, your work day, your work, comprises 36% of your waking hours. More than a third, 36% of your waking hours is devoted to work. And you may say, well, it's actually more than that. Because in today's knowledge economy, when we get home, we might bring some of our work with us. We might be, might be thinking of work. We might re be replying to emails at, uh, when, when, when we get home, meaning that 36% might in fact be the lower limit, and it might be significantly more than that. The point is, we spend, you and I spend a lot of time with our kids and with our work. And so it is very worth our while looking at what does the Bible have to say about kids, 
and what does the Bible have to say about work. And that is our task today, to look at what the Bible says, specifically the book of Ephesians, what does the Bible say about kids, and what does it say about our work. So, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. If you do not have a Bible, I encourage you to download one in your smart device, or you can get a Bible from the back. Here we go, Ephesians chapter 6, verses, we'll start from verses 1 to 4. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Next verse, bond servants. And you go, whoa, that's it? For kids? That's all Paul had to say about raising kids? Rex just talked about the amount of time that we spend raising kids, and here we have these just three or four verses. Well, this is God's Word. And we, if we dig deeply, there's a lot underneath these verses, actually. And that's what we're going to do right now. So let's begin to dissect these verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So this verse is specifically addressed to children, and the command is to obey. What does obey mean? It means to comply with. It means to follow. It means to submit yourself to. Or in other words, children, do what your parents say. It's essentially that. Children, obey your parents. And it's specific as to who the children should comply with. Obey your parents. Notice that it says parents, both of them, father and mother. So children are to obey both father and mother, and these, this means uh, one thing. It said actually both two things. Parents have to be in step with one another with regards to what they expect obedience in. They have to be in step with one another with regards to what the children should expect from them. This wasn't exactly obedience, but this reminds me of an instance when I was a little kid, and each day I would ask for an allowance from my parents so that I could buy snacks during recess. And I noticed that when I approached my mother, she would give me the equivalent of a nickel. That went a long way back then. <laughs> when I approached my father, he would give me the equivalent of a dime. Guess what I did? Guess what I did? I went to my father, and I would ask, hey, Pa, can you give me my allowance for today? Well, it turns out I think that both of them talked with each other before too long, because after a while, my father was now giving me a nickel, as well as my mother was giving me a nickel. If I were smarter, I would have asked for an allowance from my mother and then my father. I would have gotten 15 cents, but I wasn't that smart that day. The point being, parents, mom and dad, be in step with one another as you instruct your children so when, when you expect them to obey, to, you, to obey you. Second point, the command, children, obey your parents, implies that you as father and mother are actively engaged in your children's life and that you are giving instruction for them to obey. Your, pay, your children cannot obey this instruction if you are not giving your children things to obey. And it denotes a level of engagement of both father and mother in the raising of your kids. And again, it's not just one parent, but both. And it implies a level of engagement throughout the life of your child when you are raising them at home. Now, why do we do that? The verse says, children, obey your parents. For the reason, in the Lord, for this is right. In the Lord means that this obedience of children to parents goes in line with the general obedience to Christ, general obedience to God. And also for this is right that regardless of culture, regardless of society, it is just right and proper that children be obeying 
their parents. And we see, if we look at the Old Testament, that the penalty for disobedience to parents is actually very severe. If you would turn to Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21, or you could listen, I'm going to read Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. This is what it says according to Old Testament law. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, of his city this son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men in the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. In other words, in the Old Testament law, disobedience to parents was equated with evil. And the command was to purge evil from your sight, and there actually was a command to stone a disobedient son. Now, we, you and I do not live under Old Testament law today. And yet, even looking at us now and in the future, disobedience to parents is something that the Lord frowns upon. If you look, for example, at 2 Timothy verses 3, 1 to 2, 2 Timothy 3, 3, 1 to 2, it talks about the last days. It says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, and the list goes on. So you see here that talking about the signs of the last days and the awful things that would happen in the last days, that disobedience to parents is something that makes that list. So first command, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why is this important? Stay on till the, till the end of the message because I'll unpack why obedience is actually quite important in the whole scheme of things. Let's go now to the next command. So it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. The next command is a quote from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy 5, 16, which gives the Ten Commandments. It says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that life may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. That live long in the land speaks about the land that the Israelites were entering, the promised land. The promise was that if you honor your father and mother, a general promise that life will go well with you and that you would have a long life. What does honor mean? Honor means to put a high value on someone or something. When you put a high value on someone or something, then you're obeying that person uh, or that object. There was a Christian author who, who taught a lot about honor, and I listened to when I was uh, a younger father. And I, I had this practice at home that my, at, at first my daughters thought was pretty cool, but as they grew older, they thought it was a bit silly. But I said, I am so honored that I'm in the same room with you because I value you. And this is fantastic to be just with you. And I'd be driving along the highway with my daughter there, and actually in the front seat. I don't know if that was legal back then. I don't know if it was legal today. <laughs> but she was in the front seat, and I would roll down my window, and I would shout at the top of my lungs, I'm with my daughter! That's a way of being so excited and honoring her. And at that time, my daughter, oh, she, she would laugh. And then they came to an age where they'd start rolling their eyes when I started doing that. But still... The point is that I said, I value you. I honor you. You're my daughter. You're God's gift to me. I love you. I honor you. I'm so happy to just be in this room with you or driving down the road in this car with you. This command, honor your father and mother. I thought, see, see obedience, obedience, the first command stops at a certain time. 
Because it says here, for example, uh, earlier in Ephesians, uh, this is uh, chap uh, Ephesians 5, chapter, I'm sorry, sorry, verse 31, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When a man marries and becomes one flesh with his wife, he in effect leaves the household, and he lives, leaves the authority to obey, the, the, the command to obey his father and mother because now he has his own household. So I've always thought that this command to children obey your parents has a statute of limitations. When you get married, leave the home, or when you leave the home, as Jesus illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son, the son, the first son said, Father, I want my inheritance now, and then went off took himself out of the father's household. But this command to honor your parent, honor your father and mother, I thought, is lifelong. It's something that you and I do for the rest of our lives. I just noted, I just realized that even though this command to honor your father and mother is indeed lifelong in one sense, it actually is not lifelong in another sense. Because when a parent dies, then you can honor that parent no longer, at least in person. When a parent dies, then goes your opportunity to honor your father or your mother. And this really came to life. And it, it's the only command if you look at the Ten Commandments, when it says, do not kill. Do not steal. Do not covet. Those Ten Commandments, they apply to you, they apply to me for the rest of the time that you or I live. We can do that. But to honor your father and mother. When my parent, parents die, I can no longer do that to them or for them. Two Fridays ago, I got a call, a phone call from my brother late at night. And my wife and I were just reading in bed and I said, it's for my brother, and 10, 10, 10 or so p.m., I, I said, I better take this call. And my brother called to let me know that my mother had passed away. My mother, as you may know, as I've shared on some occasions, uh, is in the Philippines, was in the Philippines, and has been suffering from Alzheimer's disease for at least 10 years. And I knew that one day this, this phone call would come. I knew it. I knew it, and I thought to myself, what might this phone call sound like, look like, when might it come? And I finally got that call, and I tell you that you may anticipate a call like that, but you're never prepared to receive it. You're never prepared to receive it. And so my brother, uh, who called me, lives in the U.S. There are four of us siblings who live, all live in the U.S., so we were making arrangements to, to fly, fly back to the Philippines to be with my father who lives in the Philippines with my, with my mother and to be with family and friends uh, for my mother's wake and funeral. It was a long flight going there. Uh, it was a 32-hour trip from door to door. It was also a 32-hour trip going back. I arrived last night, so if I stumble or make mistakes today, please, please excuse me. But the point being that I realized as I was there sharing memories and laughter and tears and sadness and joy, that I, yes, I can honor the memory of my mother, but my time to honor my mother in person had just passed, had just passed. And I can do that no more. So what I did was, well, I made a point of honoring the person that I can. Honoring my father. And I tried to honor him publicly. I spoke well of him. I told him how much I love him, how much I value him. I thanked him for how he loved my mom how He loves us, cared for us, provided for us, was there for us. 
And so my ad admonition to you and encouragement to all of us here, put this into practice. Honor your father and mother. Do it in a way that is meaningful to them. Do it in a way that is meaningful to them. How do you know that? What I did years ago was I asked. I actually asked my father. Father, my, I said, Papa, I want to put into practice this command to honor your father and mother. How can I do that for you? And you need to be prepared for the answer that your father or mother gives you and to put it into practice even if you don't think that's the way that you yourself would like to be honored. And my father said, well, one way that you could honor me is to continue to do good in your work. My father took great pride in the accomplishments of his children. And he said, when you do well in whatever you do, you're honoring me. And for me, I go, well, that's not how I would think of honor your parents. For example, for my own children, I feel very honored when they come to me to this day, even though they live their own lives, I feel very honored when they ask for my opinion about something. I have no expectation, I'll share my opinion, share my advice with no expectation that they would do it, but when they ask Dad, what do you think about this? I feel very honored that way. But that's not how it, is. it was with my father. He wanted to hear about my accomplishments. So I tell him. I took the time to tell him about the work that I do, for example, because I thought, okay, that's how he wants to be honored, and, fa and Pa, I will honor you in that way. So please, it's a commandment with a statute of limitations. Honor your father and mother. If you need to send a text message right now, or you have my permission to do so, take out your phone, text your father or mother or both, and say something that honors them. Now, as we know, this commandment to honor your father and mo mother is part of the Ten Commandments. It's actually commandment number five out of the ten. And these Ten Commandments are written on two tablets that face each other. Commandments 1 to 5 are written, including honor your father and mother in the Jewish tradition. And then commandments 6 to 10 are written on the other half of, of these two tablets. And the first half, commandments 1 to 5, are known as duties to God. And commandments 6 to 10 are known as duties to your fellow men. Duties to God, commandments 1 to 5. Duties to others, commandments 6 to 10. And you may think, well, honor your father and mother. Isn't that to other people? Why is it lumped along with duties to God? And according to the Jewish tradition, the reason it is lumped with those first four commandments are that commandments 1 to 4 are duties to God and duties to our Creator. And the thinking is, that our father and mother, they are our biological creator. They are our creator in one sense, biologically. And that is why, in the Jewish tradition, that honor your father and mother is lumped along with duties to God. And when you think of that, that, this, that this way, it gives a huge emphasis on the importance for you and me to honor our father uh, and mother. All right. Next verse, Ephesians 1, I mean Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It is a specific command to fathers. Now, the Bible does say that both fathers and mothers are responsible for teaching and instructing their children. Proverbs 1 to 8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's teaching. To, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. So it's both, both fathers and mothers. But this verse in Ephesians is specific to fathers. It says, Fathers, and do not exasperate your children, according to some translations, or do not provoke your children to anger. 
when I see a command like this, I automatically think that a reason that command is there, it's because it's something that we are apt to do. It's something that we are prone to do. If it is something that we would never do, then there would be little reason to include that as a biblical command. But it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, in a way implies that this is something that I, as a father, or you as a father, might be prone to do. And you and I are warned to not provoke our children to anger, to not exasperate them. And it doesn't say how we do that, but I think it doesn't take too long for us as fathers to figure out what, the, what are things we do that, ex, that would exasperate our children. And there are several ways. If we are absent, if we are not engaged, then we could be exasperating our children. If you take the other end of the spectrum, if you and I are harsh with our children, if you and I have unrealistic expectations with our children, or if you and I desire things for our children that actually is more a desire for ourselves and we're projecting that on our children, then we might be exasperating our children as well. And when I look at my own life, I can think of times when I was guilty of provoking my children to anger in one way or another. And so for my grown children now, I apologize to you for that. And I ask for forgiveness for my six children for the times that I have failed this biblical command and I have exasperated you as my son and as my daughter. And I would like to say it was intentional, but I was responsible nonetheless for doing so. And I'm very sorry, my children, for having done that to you at one point or another when you were living with us. Do not exasperate your children. But it says instead, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Other translations say, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That verb here where it says, but bring them up, a synonym of that is nourish. The word actually, the Greek word used here is to, to nourish, to, to bring up to rear, to nourish. So the implication is that, yes, we think of mothers as primarily giving care to children, but it also says fathers, nourish, rear, bring up your children. That implies a long period of time to bring up our children. It replies time and effort for you and me as a father, a level of engagement. We don't just say, grow up and I'll see you in college. No, we don't, doesn't, we doesn't say that, right? It implies a level of engagement, a care of being there for our children from the time that they are young to the time that they are older. And when we look at statistics today, it actually is a very sad picture because the U.S. Census has shown that 23% of U.S. households have a single parent. 23% have a single parent. Now, it could be both father and mother, or, or mo uh, but given that 90% of welfare recipients are mothers or women, you would think that most of these single-family households are a household where a, the father is absent from the household. From, if you look at other countries, that figure 23% in the U.S., it is 3% in China and 5% in India, 23% in the U.S., 40% of births in the U.S. today are to unmarried women. Now, it doesn't say single parent or mother and father who are together but are married, but the fact remains that's 40%. And if you take all of these figures together, the conclusion that we can draw is that there's a crisis actually of fatherhood in the U.S. right now in that many fathers are absent from the household absent from the household to bring up their children in the way that they should go and to give them instruction, admonition, discipline, and training. Now, 
discipline and instruction in what? Well, it's really in all things that pertain to life, caring for their physical needs, bringing them up in the way that they should act, bringing them up in being able to provide for themselves to, have a li- to, make, to make a living in the future. It's all aspects of life that you and I, as, as fathers, are responsible. There are many ways to do it. There are many ways to do it. The Bible doesn't say so, and the, the point is that you do it. And why is it important? It's important to start young. The Bible says, it's Proverbs 22, 6, bring up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's not an absolute guarantee that, yes, children actually can depart from it when they're older, but that command remains, bring up a child in the way that they should go. And I'm I'm sorry that I have to use this as an example, but it was the example that came to mind about training up our children. It actually had to do with potty training. I, I, I read that in potty training in some countries like Germany and in Sweden, when they teach their sons to be potty trained, they teach them to sit down to do a number one or a number two. And why? Well, it's because if a, ch- if a, if a, boy, go, if a boy pees sitting down, it's less spray. And when you grow up and you're cleaning the bathroom, it's less things to clean up. Somebody said it actually keeps your toothbrushes cleaner. <laughs> Sorry for being graphic, but that's what it said. And I think, when I think of that, as, as, that's brilliant, right? You're training a little boy in the way that he should go in this particular aspect of personal hygiene. And when he is old, well, chances are he might not depart from it because that's the way he was brought up. When my children were young, my wife and I used this, one one device we used was a poster that had to do, this is by Greg Harris. It says, 21 rules of this house. 21 rules of the Bernardo household. And I'm going to read it to you from 1 to 21. In this house, number one. In this house, we obey our Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, we love, honor, and pray for one another. We tell the truth. We consider one another's interests ahead of our own. We speak quietly and respectfully with one another. We do not hurt one another with unkind words or deeds. When someone needs correction, we correct him in love. When someone is sorry, we forgive him. When someone is sad, we comfort him. When someone is happy, we rejoice with him. When we have something nice to share, we share it. When we have hard work to do, we do it without complaining. We take good care of everything that God has given us. This applies to me. Number 14, we do not create unnecessary work for others. When we open something, we close it. When we take something out, we put it away. When we turn something on, we turn it off. When we make a mess, we clean it up. When we do not know what to do, we ask. When we go out, we act just as if we were in this house. Finally, when we disobey or forget any of the 21 rules of this house, we accept the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That worked for us as a household. Now, it doesn't say here how you should train and discipline and admonish and instruct your children. It doesn't say how. And like many things in the Bible, it's up to you as fathers how to apply this in a manner that works for you and in a manner that is meaningful to you. And so it might involve a variety of things. It might involve reading the Bible to your kids. It might involve telling Bible stories. It might involve homeschooling them. It might involve sending them to a Christian school. It might involve sending them to a public school. Uh, It might involve daily devotionals. It might not involve daily devotionals if that does not work for you. The point is that you and I have resources and much leeway on how to do things. And what is important for us is that you and I just do it. You and I just do it. Fathers, train 
your children, instruct, admonish them. There actually is a biblical model to do this on how to do this that I think applies to us all. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And it says, how? You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The point being that in the natural course of our daily existence and the time that we spend with our kids, we talk to them about God. We talk to them about the convictions we have about God. We talk to them about who God is in the natural course of how our day unfolds. That is the command, the mo the, the command given to the Israelites and the model for us. As you lie down, as you rise up, as you walk down, down the road, tell your kids. Tell your kids about God. And that then is a challenge for us as fathers and as mothers as well. So, again, for children, it's encapsulated in Ephesians. The commands are encapsulated in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 6. We go now to the rest of our passage today, which is, for slaves and their masters. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, ver uh, the next verse, verse 5 says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would obey Christ. And you'd have to stop and pause because there's a big elephant in the room, isn't it? There's a big elephant in the room in this passage about slaves and masters, and that big elephant in the room is slavery. Why doesn't the Bible condemn slavery? Why doesn't the Bible say slavery is wrong? Slavery is evil. Slavery was a huge part of life in the New Testament times. There were many slaves. There were those who were born into slavery. There were those who became slaves because they were captured in a war. And there were those who voluntarily made themselves as slaves because it was actually a better life, that they had poverty, difficulty, debt, that they agreed to enslave themselves to a richer person, either for, for a, a certain period until that debt is paid or for an indefinite period if it was too big a debt to be paid in a lifetime. So slavery is real. And especially with the history of slavery in the United States, I know it makes us uncomfortable as Americans that the Bible, the source of knowledge and truth, does not explicitly condemn slavery. And so, before we can deal with this passage on instructions to slaves and masters, we need to tackle that question first. And this is where my interpretation is what I'll share with you. Again, there's no verse in the Bible that says, this is the reason why the Bible doesn't condemn slavery. And so this is my interpretation. And you may agree with this, or you might disagree with this interpretation on why this is so. Jesus said two things. Among, among the things that He said, He said two things. Number one, what was the reason Jesus came? He told Zacchaeus, when he called Zacchaeus down from the tree, he told Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That is why Jesus came. He came to seek and to save the lost. He did not come to establish a new kingdom here on earth. He did not come to change politics on earth. He did not come to change society on earth. He did not come to eradicate disease on earth, although He healed people. He did not wave a magical wand and 
do away with all sickness or do away with all suffering. Jesus said that I have come to seek and save the lost, and that was what Jesus focused on. And Jesus also said uh, in John 18, 26, that my kingdom is not of this world. When he, during his trial, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. That if Jesus' kingdom were of this world, he would have called his servants who would have freed Jesus. But Jesus said, no, my kingdom is not of this world. And for me personally, that is a reason why I think the Bible does not condemn slavery because that is not why Jesus came. Not to change society or political order or economies, but He came to seek and save the lost. So instead, what we're given in the Bible is given what we have in society. Slaves and masters, this is how you are to treat each other. It says bond servants in my ESV translation. Other translations would say slaves. Bond masters, here's what you're to do. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. That word fear is actually the root of that word fear in Greek is phobia. And when we think of phobia, we think of you know, something that is undesirable. But, but it's that, that extent of fear. Fear and trembling is how we are to relate to our, to the slaves are to relate to these masters. It says, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Meaning that a slave is to submit or obey his or her master as if that slave were obeying Christ himself. It says, not by way of eye service as people, as uh, people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, again, that's the sincerity there, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or he is free. So the command to slaves is simple. Submit yourselves to your, to, submit yourselves to your master in the same way that you would submit to Christ. Do your work sincerely. Do not do it in the way that's just you're showing off or trying to please your master or, or behaving well only when your master is looking at you. Or not as people pleasers, not to show off to fellow slaves and see how good a slave you are, but sincerely, with a sincere heart, as if your master is Jesus himself, because in reality, your master is Jesus himself. And then it says in the next verse, it says, Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. What does it mean, masters, do the same to them? When it says same, it, uh, Paul is talking about doing good to them. So, slaves are to do good to their masters, and masters are to do good to slaves. And Paul tells slaves that you're equal in the sight of God in the sense that God is your master. And it says here to masters, there's no partiality with him. In other words, status in society or social economic status does not, does not apply to God. And of course, you and I here are not in a slave-master relationship. And yet I would think that the principles here apply to a workplace as well. That when you and I do the work for which we are paid, that you and I are to do so as to God. We do our work as unto God. That we do so with a sincere heart. We don't just do it to please our bosses, but we do it sincerely. We don't, don't just do it as people pleasers for our coworkers. We don't do it only when our masters are watching, our bosses are watching, but we do it as unto God. And if you're supervising somebody, if somebody's working under your supervision, then you do the same. You do it well. You treat those working for you well. Remember that there is no partiality with God. Now, if we just take these two commands, the, these two sets of instruction, to children, parents, and to slaves and master, masters in isolation, we actually might miss a bigger picture. 
because we need to see the context of this passage here in Ephesians as well as in other passages. And we see that in the Bible it clearly lays out relationships that have to do with headship and authority and submission, relationships that have to do with love and respect, relationships that have to do with honor and obedience. If we think of it, Jesus and the Father were equal, are equal, but Jesus submitted Himself willingly to the will of the Father and died on the cross so that you and I might be saved. And I shared, I had the opportunity to share this very brief gospel message at my mother's funeral. And I went to the words of the Apostle John. In 1 John 5, 11 to 13, John wrote, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And that is our assurance that indeed God has given us eternal life and it is in His Son. And if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, please talk to me, talk to Pastor Brett, talk to somebody. We'd be love to tell you more about who Jesus is and what He has done for us. And Jesus, again, submitted Himself to the Father's will despite His equality with God the Father. We think of Christ and the church and the headship of Christ over the church and the church submitting to Christ. We think of the headship and authority of elders over a local church. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter is encouraging the elders of the church to shepherd the flock well, to shepherd the flock well, and he's also encouraging younger men to submit to the elders' authority. Not that the elders are any way superior to the younger in the church of, or of more value than those in the church. They're all equal in terms of worth and honor, but the elders have been given a role and responsibility to submit to the elders. In the same way, this area of submission reminds us of the army. That, for example, a sergeant would submit to a lieutenant, a lieutenant to a captain, a captain to a major, a major to a lieutenant colonel, a lieutenant colonel to a colonel, a colonel to a general. You submit because of rank over you. It doesn't mean that this person at a higher rank is any better or more valuable than you, but you honor and respect that rank, and by virtue of that rank, you submit a lieutenant would submit to a captain. The same way here in a church, the younger men submit to the elders. Pastor Brett preached on marriage last week, a very important relationship. It clearly says in the Bible, it says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, and the reason is given. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. Therefore, the wife should submit to the husband in everything. It doesn't mean that the husband is in any way more valuable or superior to the wife, but it is that same line of submission that we see in different types of relationship. So, as Pastor Brett said, a wife submits to the husband, but the husband cares for, cherishes, nurtures the wife because of his submission to the will of, to the will of God that because of a love for Christ in the same way that as, as Christ loved the church, the husband should love and cherish and nourish the wife. And husbands, that is an extremely high calling for you and me to care for and nourish our wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. If you think of the way, that sacrificial way that Christ loved the church, that's the same kind of love that you and I are, and us husbands are called to. And you see this same line of headship and submission and love and respect and honor and, and obedience when it says, children, obey your parents. Submit to your parents. It's not that your parents are smarter than you, although as parents we may think we are, at least at a certain point in life, but that's the command of children. 
Obey your parents. Parents, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But in the way that we care for and nourish our children, it's an outgrowth of our love for Christ. And therefore, we raise and nurture our own children. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Psalm 127 says, children are a blessing from the Lord. And the blessings from the Lord, we take care of. We take care of the blessings that we receive from the Lord. And we see that with parents and children. Yes, all children, honor your father and mother. It's that same point of, I, I, honor, I honor you because of who you are to me. And we have here slaves and masters, that same line of authority and submission. Slaves, submit to your earthly masters. But the command to masters is, well, masters, treat your slaves properly. And to a slave owner, that would have been totally out of this world because a master has complete control over a, over a slave. And to tell a master, no, you need to treat your your slaves well, to do good to others, to do good to them, that would have been a totally radical kind of command. So the point is, especially in the world that you and I live today, when there is much rebellion against authority, well, these are the structures and authorities that God has given us. Romans 13 said that there is no, there is no authority that God has not ordained. I forgot to mention rulers and citizens, governors and citizens, kings and citizens, that you and I are called to submit to the governing or ruling authorities over us because those, the Bible says, have been ordained by God. And so we see here this beautiful picture of how you and I are called to live out our lives, that we are called to live out our lives in submission to the God-given authority placed on us, and those in authority are called to treat those whom they are over in a way that honors them and that honors Christ. I know it can be difficult. In this day and age, it can be difficult. If you have a bad boss, that is extremely difficult. If you have a, a husband who might not be treating you according to what we read in the Bible, that might be difficult. If we have a... a uh, an official in our government who, in our opinion, is not doing well, that can be difficult. Well, actually, the Bible has something to say about that too. It says here in 1 Peter 2, 11 to 23, Servants, be subject to your own masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow His footsteps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. But he suffered. When he suffered, he did not, not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And I close this message with this encouragement. Christ continued committing himself to him who judges justly when he was suffering? And when you and I are in a difficult situation and we're called to submit, this, the Bible says, should be our attitude. We're actually called to suffer, to continue to, to do good, but it says, just like Christ, to commit ourselves to him, the righteous final judge who, just, who judges justly. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus, dear Holy Spirit, thank you for your word today. Thank you 
that you do instruct us on how to live our lives. Indeed, this series is called This is Living. And thank you for your word. Thank you for your instruction. Lord, thank you for, for us parents. We thank you for the children that you have given us. Regardless of their age, when, help us, Lord, to, to look after them. Lord, for those here with small kids, I pray for your grace and truth and mercy and love and strength as they continue to train and instruct their children in the way that they should go, as they continue to bring up and raise and nurture the children whom you have entrusted to their care. Lord, to, we pray, I pray for ourselves that you would help us to honor our father, to honor our mother, to tell them we value them, to tell them we love them. And Lord, I do am aware that there are broken relationships. There could be broken relationships between parents and children, between grown parents and, and aging fathers and mothers. Lord, I pray that you would reach down before it's too late, that you would reach down and heal those relationships so that you would give the opportunity for all of us, Lord, to honor our father and our mother. Lord, I pray for fathers who have that great responsibility to nurture, to care for, to bring up, to rear their children in the way that they should go, to teach and admonish, to train, to discipline their children. And Lord, from experience, I know that takes much effort and sometimes we fail. And we ask for forgiveness. But above all, we ask for grace and your mercy and strength. Lord, we pray for us as employees and we pray for us as bosses. Thank you. You say in your word that we are Christ's workmanship created for good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. And thank you for the good works that we have right now be it in ministry, be it good works at the home, be it good works in the workplace, in our offices, uh, in our factories from re remote work. Help us to do, Lord, our work as unto you, to do so with a willing heart, uh, to do so with a sincere heart, not as people pleasers or as, as uh, just when our boss is looking. And Lord, for those of us who are who have responsibility over the well-being of employees, help us, Lord, to be good bosses, to treat our employees fairly, to treat them well, to look after their well-being. Lord, remind us that we stand equal before you, our Lord and Savior. Regardless of where we are in life, we stand equal before you, that before you, riches do not matter. Our rank or our rank or our status does not matter. And what matters, Lord, is that we are children of God, children of God the Most High. And our prayer, Lord, is that you would continue to change us from the inside out, from one level of glory to another, so that we would be more like you. And Lord, we long for that day when we would see you face to face when everything is perfect. But till that day, would you continue to change us? and help us to be faithful in the here and now where you have placed, placed us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us. God is for you. We read in number six of a blessing, a prayer upon God's people. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace.
us and keep us indeed. May the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Have a wonderful week. God's blessings to all.